Welcome to Home Dad Chat, brought to you by the National At Home Dad Network. My name is Brock. My name is Danny. We are here to talk about life as stay at home dad. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. No, I don't want much. I even love handmade crafts made of macaroni. Come on now, you should know me. Sometimes I might eat too much. No worry about my weight, got the dad bod rocking on me. Sketches on my feet, cargo shorts look good on me. I'm a dad, that's what I do. Hey everybody, welcome back to Home Dad Chat. Uh, man, I have I have Danny with me. This is uh, this is quite interesting because uh, we missed last week with you all because uh, life happens and so does COVID. And uh, I'm pretty much sure that uh, the shirt COVID sucks is probably selling out everywhere. Uh, <laughs> Danny's Danny's probably put some stock into it I, after this past. I'd, yeah, I'd buy one for sure. For sure. Yeah, I was. Um, uh, it was a rough patch for me. I'm going to knock on wood that I haven't really had to deal with it. Although my friend thinks that back during Christmas time, I probably had it and didn't like get tested for it because it just felt like a common cold. So mm-hmm. I've heard that a lot and I've seen it like with the kids and with other friends and they were like, well, I finally got toasted, uh, tested and they didn't have it. And I'm like, well, yeah. So I checked my kids, like checked one of my oldest this morning because he wasn't feeling well. I'm like, no, no, we got an at home test. Let's do this thing. And he doesn't, he tested negative. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, he's only got a sore throat and fatigue, and maybe that's just a cold. Maybe it's strep throat. Maybe it's tonsillitis. I don't know. So, Who knows? yeah, you know, it's it's tough. It's hard to navigate. So, um, hey, man, I'm glad to have you. Glad to have you back. And uh, you yeah, look, look like you you got your energy back, uh, or not really. No, but that- <laughs> it's, a, it's a fake. I just enjoy being here. That's all. That's I, yeah. Well, you know, it is kind of all it is. I, you, I, get behind, <laughs> you get behind the microphone and all of a sudden it's like energy boost. And then afterwards you're like, you fall asleep immediately. Yep. I'll be asleep in my chair. <laughs> it's all good. But Hey man. Yeah. Um, it's definitely been an interesting, interesting past couple of weeks. Uh, I, I think that probably the most, uh, uh, wild thing that's taken place is the fact that i i sadly had to watch uh the Bengals lose in the super bowl on sunday so that was yep. that was rough uh had to console a nine-year-old who had just picked the Bengals as his team and was very excited Aww. for them i mean we've lived here for quite a while we're not going anywhere so it's a it's kind yeah. of a, a perfect uh, fit for him but so i yeah. don't but with the Bengals, it doesn't he just i mean and that just what he's going to get used to uh yeah there's a lot of that Listen. that's that's that is i don't the, know no it just, no you're it was fine. an easy fine. shot it was a yeah, grapefruit no, i had to hit it you, you definitely hit the pot shot for sure on that <laughs> one so um yeah well i mean yeah 30 some years without without a super bowl appearance or you know in playoff appearances is sporadic but it it, it um, is huge that they went this year that is it, is it really is fantastic and win or not i still think they def from what i've looked at the highlights of it because i was i was a sleeping through the whole thing um <laughs> it, they really did put in their effort to get there and to get to get through the mm-hmm. game i think i think they did you should be proud of them oh we you are know, win or yeah. not you know definitely proud of them i'm definitely proud of the way that they've handled it and then on top of it too i mean some of these players because of the um the contract that the rookies signed for five years with the team that drafts them like you know we're joe burrow is going to be around for a while jamar chase is going to be around for a while you know Good. our Good. our uh, um money mac uh um evan mckenzie or evan mcpherson the uh kicker who he one thing that he did was is he tied uh, Adam Vinatieri's single postseason record for field goals in a postseason at, nice. four, at 14. He's a rookie and he did that. So, um, wow. So that's pretty impressive, too. So, I mean, you know, from everything from comeback player of the year with Joe Burrow, um, you know, outstanding rookie of the year with Jamar Chase, and then, you know, to have have a uh, Evan uh, to be able to do that tie with uh, with Vinatieri and it's it is a very impressive team and I'm, I I think that this will not be the last time uh, that you see them in a playoff plus mm-hmm. Super Bowl run I, I I wouldn't be surprised if they're in the hunt next year honestly um, they're just that tough of a team and if they pick up the right O line for this year uh, we will be a super force to be reckoned with so it'll be exciting yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, you have a good team, even if they're not, you know, in the Super Bowl every year from now on, which I honestly, for you, hope they are. 
<laughs> but you do have a better team and people that you can get behind and root for and watch them play well and watch them win. That's going to be very encouraging, especially for your son. Yeah. You know? Well, and just for the city as a whole, it was exciting to see the city just light up with excitement. Um, people coming together and just having a good time and stuff. It was yeah. really neat, like from a artistic standpoint to see like the whole city glowing in orange. Like there were places that, um, you know, changed their colors up to be yeah. glowing orange and like the whole stadium one night it was neat because like different people who were like photographers that I follow here in town, like had their drones out. Uh, because they have license to do that nice. and um so you get these awesome shots of like you know uh skyscrapers and all kinds of like the stadiums lit up and things yeah uh, one of the big skyscrapers downtown they turned on all the lights and turned off the ones that they needed to to make it say who day on the side of the skyscraper <laughs> which is really cool very cool yeah but just stuff like that was a lot of a lot of fun so and mm -hmm. then i heard a really funny story uh so saturday my dad came into town because um uh, my son's birthday was uh on on valentine's day and so um they came into town we did a bunch of bengal stuff uh there's a one of the game balls they gave to a local brewery uh close to me so i took my dad over there so he could get a picture with the game ball which he was like a kid in the candy store over there mm -hmm. and uh they were saying that at this uh, place that um, like apparently like Jamar Chase bought a house off of somebody that they knew or whatever. And then like Joe Burrow was like, I want to live next to you and like walk down the street asking people if they could, if he could buy their house. And apparently like somebody agreed to it. So he bought a house on the street. And then I think Sam Hubbard, who's like one of the other guys on the line, like he bought a house on that street too. So there's three guys, they all live like next to each other basically and this is something you don't hear about very often no that kind no. of thing is this this camaraderie of these young football players yeah yeah and potentially if they're young their first house you know and you buy it next to your teammates next to your friends that's awesome right yeah that's very so, cool well and and that's the thing with joe and jamar i mean they they went through college together and won a national championship with lsu so they've got they've got quite the connection there um but yeah it's just it's stuff like that are cool stories i thought it was really neat too um was that um andrew uh Whit or whitworth uh won the uh man of the year award the the um um peyton or not peyton what is it um i can't think of his name now anyway it's the man of the year award it's um uh for like doing it, all kinds of um volunteer work and and things like that being just a, an amazing force in the community and apparently like has been a part of like 35 different like community nonprofit projects out there in the the area for LA and he used to be he played nice. 11 he played 11 seasons for the Bengals before he went out and he's played five seasons for the Rams now and he's the third oldest player um to have played in the uh, Super Bowl at the age of four in his 40s so um but for him to win that award, that was pretty cool. He's a really awesome guy. I was sad when they let him go, but it was kind of a weird situation, but it was neat mm -hmm. to see him win that award. So, yeah. 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 Can you imagine playing football at all in your forties? I mean, like actual football, we were going to knock you down, much less playing in the Super Bowl in your forties, man. I mean, kudos. Look, Tom Brady kudos. did it all those years yeah. too. That's, that's the thing. I mean, so, and, but yeah, it, it's a, I couldn't imagine it. I mean, I I'm 42 mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm falling apart already with all the different <laughs> crap I've got going on. And right. uh, so right. like, like that was the thing I saw a guy actually post in a, uh, one of the other stay at home dad groups, uh, it was like, Hey, I turned 40 on Saturday. Uh, what should I be looking forward to? And someone was like turning 41. And I was like, I was looking through, it was like, someone's like falling apart, like starting to like feel it every morning. Like, There's the truth right yep. there. Yep. You're going to have a good knee. Mm -hmm. well, that's, maybe. that's, this is my good knee. This is my bad knee, but this is my good knee. Yeah. And your good knee is only just a little bit better than your bad knee. Right. Right. It doesn't hurt when it rains. That's the only difference. The other yeah, the bad the knee only, hurts when it rains. Right. It's the one that helps you limp with the other one. <laughs> you don't need crutches because that's what yep, the left yep. knee is. That's your crutch. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, anyway, other than all of that, has uh in you your you know your battle through uh COVID, how uh mm -hmm. how have things been? Are you doing you doing pretty good though, other than all that? 
Overall, yeah, doing great. Uh, I'm, I'm still exhausted. I mean, I get winded walking from the bed to the kitchen, literally. And, I, and I'm just like, why can I not breathe? What is going on? But, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it was bad for me. I didn't get my booster shot. And um, that's, that's the thing. Um, mm. I think that really, if I'd gotten my booster, I'd have just had a bad cold and walked it off and uh, been no problem. But I've always, I've had a lot of lung problems. I get uh, uh, bronchitis a lot, which is just you know, like inflammation, but not an infection kind of thing, not like pleurisy or whatever, but just, just, yeah. it gets irritated. And we had a moment and I'll tell you, and this will sober it up for just a second. But uh, at, at one point in one day, I looked at Marnie and I said, okay, so we need to think about things. Um, uh, if this goes bad, because you know, we've recently lost two family members to COVID over, over the last year, and um, it can go bad suddenly, and you don't even know it, it just does. Um, and I said, so where are we, where are we going to have the funeral? You know, I mean, and that was a discussion that we had, because we were at a point where it could go either way, you know, and we were like, do I need to go to the, the emergency room, because I'm having trouble breathing, and is my oxygen dropping? And fortunately, everything was fine ish and, uh, worked out after time, but it's still, I mean, I feel like hammered crap. I really do. Um, but, um, hey, I'm not dead and I'm very, very grateful. I'm very, very happy for, thank you for all the prayers and everybody keeping in touch with me and messaging. And, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was rough for me. It really was. But again, it's been, I think summer of last year that I got my vaccines. I got them when they first came out and then I didn't get a booster. And the only reason I didn't get a booster is I'm dumb. I, uh, <laughs> I got everybody else, their shots. I got all the kids, their shots. We moved up here. I got the dogs, her shots. I got everybody going. And even Marnie said, I thought you got your booster. And I'm like, looking at my card, I didn't. So yeah, that, that made it much worse. I think if I'd had that, uh, I, I would have had an easier time of it, but, um, that's fine. You know. And that, but that it's interesting though, too. Like, I mean, you say that, that, you know, that's dumb or whatever, but how many times have we all as stay at home dads and just stay at home parents in general, like had that conversation where it's like, I thought I did this, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever. And it's like, yeah. it didn't happen because there were so many things being juggled and it just <laughs> yeah. got missed over, you know, it's yeah. like, and you put I, yourself last. I mean, very, so many times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And here's, and here's a, a very good, hard example of, where it can go if you mm -hmm. are not putting yourself in a place that's not last like yeah. we say it all the time we've said it on the show I'll oh yeah oh yeah take care of yourself go to the doctor get your stuff done self-care 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 and i'm like Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all guilty we're, we're all me. we're all guilty of uh of definitely yeah. you know eating some crow on on stuff like yeah. that so yeah, yeah. It's, it's i know good. i'm not perfect so hey, at least you came out on the other side so that's that's mm -hmm. the important part yeah um, Definitely. cool, man. Yeah. Well, things have been going pretty good here. Um, mm -hmm. nothing too crazy. Uh, so I can't, I, yeah, I think the only thing coming up here for us is that, uh, uh, Corey's going to have a uh, knee surgery for some, uh, for a mass that she found behind her kneecap when, when they did an MRI. Um, uh, yeah. but it's a pretty, um, pretty minor surgery, but still it's one of those deals where it's like, you know, she's, she's going to be off her feet for a while. Um, mm -hmm. so it's pretty wild. Like she'll be off her feet, uh, surgery on that Thursday. And then on that Saturday, I'm taking, uh, Ruby to her first and my first, uh, father daughter dance. So, Aww. uh, yeah. So yeah. excited about that. I mean, cause she, she entered school and then, then, uh, wasn't able to do it because of COVID. And so this will be the first year that they're going to finally do it. So it's nice. going to be fun. That's sweet. But yeah, so we're doing that. But other than that, things are good, man. And, uh, yeah. you know, tonight, uh, I'm excited because we've got, we, we've got three guests tonight, man. It's going to be mm -hmm. a lot Crazy. of, a lot of voices about to come Crazy. on the show. <laughs> so, um, you want to give a little heads up of how we're, we got to these guests. I, I think you should honestly, cause sure. I, I feel like you, you've had the most uh, hand in it. Well, I know we, uh, the, the, the first thing is we received a message. It's basically one of our members that wanted to talk about uh, a book his wife is uh, getting published and doing a study for. And uh, his name's Mark Fasano. And I don't know Mark, um, hadn't spoken to him previously, but uh, he did ask. And I think that's one thing that's a, a sign of uh, a, a good member is you'll say, I'd like to talk about this. Where can I talk about it? As opposed to just po posting and whatever because we do have rules against self-promotion. So I really, again, appreciate him doing that. Um, 
But then uh, after talking with him a little bit, I got really interested in the book and um, it's called, uh, Can You Help Me Give a Shit? Um, Why So Many Young People Are Struggling in School and How to Help. And it comes up mainly with teenagers and then also with college kids that they're doing studies with. Um, Now you find that the kids are, and the words they use for the book description were disconnected, demotivated, overwhelmed, and uninspired, you know? And I think for me growing up, I always thought of teenagers, even other teenagers when I was one, as lazy. You know, they're just lazy. They're just not going to do their thing. And that's not really what we find is the truth of it. Um, and the the book description, again, I think worked very well for me because it says, this book builds empathy for young people by sharing their stories in detail and helping adults who care about them see how those experiences fit within larger themes of human motivation and positive youth development. And when you think about it, like with anybody, like if I knew how to be more self-motivated, I would be doing better at things like I'd be, you know, I'd be going to the gym more often because I'd know how to get that motivation, know how to put my, my time in where I need to put my time in, you know, to, to move myself forward. Yeah, definitely. You know, so that's kind of the basis of it. And I'm, I'm looking that forward to talking to them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, we'll bring them on here and start having that conversation. So we'll be right back. Become a member of the National At Home Dad Network. It's more than a convention. It's an organization focused on providing advocacy, community, education, and support for households where the dad is the primary caregiver of the children. We do this through our webinar series, podcast series, mental health support groups, and regular online social events. But to do all of this, we need the support of the community. The National At Home Dad Network is a 100% volunteer organization, and without the generous support of its members and the community around it, but to do all this, we need the support of the community. The National At Home Dad Network is a 100% volunteer organization. Without the generous support of its members and the community around it, we would not be able to continue the work that we do. Becoming a member gives you access to our library of webinars, as well as past convention speakers' presentations. And yes, with becoming a member, there is some cool swag that you will get. For just $35 a year, you will be provided with exclusive content that only we can generate. And you'll be helping to support an organization that benefits families all around the country and the world by advocating for them offering them community and supporting them to grow in their parenthood journey. For those interested in becoming a lifetime member, a contribution of $500 or more can be made to the organization. Not only will you receive everything we've already mentioned, but also a certificate recognizing your status and an exclusive National At Home Dad coin with our Dads Don't Babysit logo. So become a member today. All right, and welcome back. Thanks for uh being a part of the rest of the show. Uh, we have our guest with us today. Uh, we have uh, Mark and Becca, who are a couple, and uh, Mark is a stay-at-home dad, and uh, Becca is uh, writing a book alongside with a uh, student uh, named Grace, and we're going to be talking with uh, Becca and Grace a little more uh, later on here in this conversation, but uh, we wanted to first get Mark and Becca's family dynamic and just kind of how things are working during this pandemic and just stay at home dad life and all those different balances. So uh, Mark and Becca, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about you guys. Thank self. you. Honey, you want to lead off or you want me to grab this? Go for it. Uh, thanks guys. So uh, the pandemic has completely upended, I think our family life because uh you know back in the day uh becca used to go into the city every morning and i uh, was with the kids but now that she's around and available uh part of my job is to try to keep our four-year-old out of her meetings with the ceo and the president and the vps and yep, yep. all of that because he doesn't understand uh the distinctions between working at home. I mean, he doesn't really understand. I explained to him that, you know, people work in an office and he asked me questions for about 30 minutes about that. He just doesn't get it. Uh, <laughs> he just so thinks it's like a game of Red Rover. Well, he said like, what's that <laughs> building? And I said, well, that's an office building. And uh, that's where that conversation went. He, he didn't really seem to understand. 
Um, mm -hmm. He also didn't understand why he couldn't just walk in there and just start rummaging through the place. But uh, right. So he's right. never actually known uh, a world where people go somewhere else to work. Oh, yeah. He knows yeah. that his mother is working, right. uh, but he doesn't understand uh, why she's not available frequently. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't remember. He's two because he's yeah. about four and a half at this point. So I've yeah. been at home for like two years. Uh, he does not remember. Yeah all of his life really I mean, yeah yeah, he's, yeah as far as he's concerned that's what happens everybody just stays in the house we just live here we go yeah. nowhere we do nothing yep. nobody yeah. visits we go to nobody's house all socializing happens via FaceTime. you know like i mean that's mm -hmm. the sort of ridiculous um yeah i just i wonder sometimes what the effect true. is on his brain <laughs> right because the older the older one remembers right the older one remembers yeah. he still has a sense of this mm -hmm. being a weird change in in how life is supposed to work um, so how many kids do you guys have two 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 okay what age is a nine-year-old oh nine, nine and four and a four yeah mm -hmm. okay. very cool yeah that, that would definitely be that would definitely be uh i'm sure quite a difference i, I know i have i have a nine-year-old and uh yeah he he struggles all the time with like why can't we do this or like his birthday came around and he's like my sister got to have a party i'm like yeah that's because it was in october we could do it outside like, yeah. <laughs> in february not so much like we're gonna give you a half birthday so uh <laughs> so mark um how long are you a, are you a full-time at-home dad or you work from home and how long have you been doing that i am a full-time at-home dad uh nice. i've been for nine years and uh nice yeah, so uh, when our oldest was, was or when Becca was pregnant with our eldest, um, we decided that we wanted to have, you know, a parent be at home with the kids. And um, honestly, you know, we were both working in academia. I was an adjunct professor uh, and she was an administrator and she just made more money than I did. And so it was a crassly financial decision, um, <laughs> which, you know, so we didn't really give a ton of thought to it. I, I felt like, uh, in the interim that I would recommend that people really think about not, not the decision to have an at-home parent, if you can afford to have one, but really like who is going to do that job. And really, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like I asked myself a lot of questions about my temperament and, you know, my particular talents. Um, you know, I think I've been a, a pretty good at-home parent, but the fact that I didn't really think about it very much still sort of bothers me yeah to be honest with you i think some of us if we thought about it too much we probably wouldn't do it because there right, is so exactly. much involved it's such a it it's is. such an on-the-job learning experience yeah. yeah well i think things specific to being an at-home dad um i think there are some advantages um not to be stereotypical or anything like but there are some real disadvantages and i think you know part of it one of them is that um you know the at-home moms tend to congregate and click with one yep. another and they will they will box you out they're not at all mm -hmm. inviting mm -hmm. that's fine i don't i don't take it personally i've 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 felt badly uh about any impact on my kids not having social opportunities because when we go to a playground i'm with them and all the moms are congregating right. with their kids and they're not inclusive at all mm -hmm. and they right. never have been that's not changed over nine years um they just you know i I think they they meet up and they want to hang out with each other and they don't want a, a dude uh, in the mix. Yeah. <laughs> and like I said, I don't care about myself, but I, I do sometimes feel badly that that's limited my mm -hmm. children's opportunities socially in a way that, you know, if they had had an at-home mom, um, that wouldn't have happened. But yeah. that's one thing that I didn't think about. I was just going to say, Grace, is context for you because I noticed you were sort of making faces like, what? <laughs> that's awful. From what I've observed, the two reasons yeah. that it happens is one, these women are gathering frequently to complain about their husbands while their children run around and play. And if a that's true. husband that, is yeah. there, then that kind of ruins yeah. the whole vibe. <laughs> so that's the, the really obnoxious reason that happens. But the other reason that I have a little bit more empathy for is is also the the social norms are such that if you're in heteronormative relationships and you're a group of women and a guy is there, all of a sudden there's all kinds of threat. Yeah. There's, is he going to start macking on us? Is he looking to go outside of his marriage in a way that there will is my husband safety. be okay with this? Right. Well, my husband, yeah. so we've, you know, and, and an assumption that there won't be shared values or shared norms that there'll be more to like have to pay attention to or be worried about. Um, I remember when we were still in Florida, the, 
that it was two moms who ran a particular play center that we liked taking Ryan mm -hmm. when he was little too. And they had to basically vouch for Mark. Like I could only go there every once in a while because at that point I was working in the office and they had to basically vouch for Mark because it was all, other than that, all moms who were mm -hmm. there. And they would like sh almost shut down in this indoor space where you really can't just like, you know, go, you can hear what everybody's saying, right? Right. And that was what you said, is that they, they kind of had to like vouch for you, right? Of like, it's they okay, he's, he's a was, good one, was, he's not. I was the sleep <laughs> yeah. dad. He's they a good one. me as the, as the sleep dad because I did, uh, I had done a ton of sleep research because uh, Becca's sister had a nightmarish situation with her eldest daughter when her when her, her daughter was a baby. Uh, gave her all kinds of problems with sleep and everything. Mm. And I just was like, I mean, the stories that she would tell us were traumatizing to me and it didn't even happen to us. So I, did, I mean, I think we just decided that uh, our kids may not learn how to eat. They may not know how to brush their teeth, but they're gonna know how to sleep. You know how to sleep. And so I'd, I'd done a lot of research and, um, you know, uh, so the owners of this play center kind of introduced me to some of the moms as the sleep dad. And mm -hmm. uh, I talked with them, you know, about stuff that I'd learned. And, you know, that was an end, but it wasn't, uh, I don't know that it moved the needle a ton, but it's so a, I had to have a skill. In other words, to even be presentable, right. I had to have like a specific. <laughs> yeah, it's a very common thing. And we run into it all the time. We have dads all the time talking about it. And the lack of community and the isolation is another part of it. But yeah. I mean, I've been to the playground and had moms kind of like, Ugh. and I'm like, I don't want, I'm not going to here to take your kids. I brought my own kids. I have four yeah. kids with me. I'm not taking any more home. What are you, why are you right. even, you know, having a concern with this? You know, you can have one of mine. I'm fine with it. You know, I'll see him tomorrow. But it's really interesting that just walking onto the playground, even if you have kids with you, they oh, yeah. just immediately have this thought of, and again, it's all of the, the dynamics that are involved in relationships and who they are as people and things like that. And it makes it really difficult, you know, really difficult. Yeah, I, I will say that, that it's become more common uh, to have to see at home dads. Uh, when I started this nine years ago, now we lived in a different part of the country, we lived in Florida. Uh, I didn't in the I red know part it. of Florida, like a mm -hmm. super yeah, red a, part of Florida. Well, in a pink, I would say at a pink part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay you just just listen to her she knows what she's talking about uh there weren't any at home dads um our neighbor across the street was um confused profound they were elderly couple and <laughs> profoundly confused like like he didn't hear me right um <laughs> yeah and that and you know when we moved up here we live in suburban philadelphia now and uh it, it's it's more common to see dads but it's not the norm by any stretch of the imagination so it's like it's not unheard of and we live in a very liberal area so of course you know uh all the moms are of course supportive and that's mm -hmm. great and they still box from you a out. distance right support <laughs> exactly <laughs> we love that idea from over here <laughs> that's right you do that over there and enjoy <laughs> exactly we're glad you're doing it it's very important <laughs> no i don't want to talk to you yep yep so you know, so how anyway, has that's so yeah. So, so how has writing the book and sort of kind of getting things rolling, how has that played a factor in just sort of like the day-to-day -day dynamics of, of your guys's family with, with this, this book being written and just the, your profession, Becca, what's that, what's that been like? I mean, it's, it's hard to find the time, honestly, that is, um, one of the many reasons that I'm delighted to be co-authoring it with you, Grace, is that there's, it, you know, uh, makes it so that there's more perspective and, and more um, to share because I still need to work my full-time job. Um, I still need to spend time with my kids. So basically any work on the book needs to happen between 8.30 to 9.30 PM um, on weeknights or between 2.30 to 4 p.m. on Saturday or Sunday. That's basically it, when, when the four-year-old is napping or when the four-year-old is be in bed um, already at night. That's, those are the only options for, uh, for working on it. Um, and Grace, I mean, of course, you're a full-time student, so it's not like Grace just is like, loads of time, she's in an right. Ivy League school, right? Like there's not, it's not like that's a low pressure environment with, uh, with lots of open time either. Um, so I don't know. I, for me, it's it's definitely been about the fact that it gives me a lot of energy. I can't normally do anything thoughtful after 8.30 at night. I've been either with the kids or at work the entire day. And uh, at that yes. by that point in night, I'm pretty much an idiot. 
Um, but <laughs> but I'm so excited by the topic and by the chance to really like the the young folks that we're interviewing and the things that they're saying are just it's energizing because of how inspiring um, it is to to listen to them talk. So that's Wait. that's part of the only way that it happens. Hearing you say that, I, I definitely appreciate you giving us the time at this time of night to talk to you then for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and, and yeah no, if I, if I sound way. stupid, that's why I blame I blame uh, my children and I forgive everyone else for that. But yeah, by, by the time of being in back to back meetings all day, I essentially was in meetings from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. on email until 5.45 p.m. making dinner, getting everybody fed, getting everybody ready for bed and then hopping onto this call. So, yeah. you know. Uh, mm -hmm. We, yeah, we, been... we can definitely understand that like both Danny and I's wives are are probably in a very similar situation with yeah. calls and meetings and things all day. My wife is a, a manager for an, a, a um, uh, in the financial industry. And so she has a team that she works with all day. So she's on Zoom calls and all that mm -hmm. all day. And Danny's, yeah. Danny's wife is, is she's she international too. Oh, yeah. No, she's a uh... I don't know where she's at, but she's, she's, up, but she's in human resources and she does a lot of support yeah. for like the people that manage huge, like LAO is Latin American organization. So all of the Latin American com com uh, countries, and they have one person that handles that. And she handles all of his not admin stuff, but like HR level. Yeah. So she's, she's a baller for sure, but she's also, you know, five o'clock in the morning, I wake up and she's gone, you know, and she's like, Oh, well, I got up early. I just went, Oh, I wanted to get a call or I wanted to do this. I, I have to go. I'm the delivery boy. Now I bring her uh, food like most days, or I'd make sure she goes like, no, no, have you had water? Have you had, you no, know, you get in here. And you know, I'm like, she's like, well, I'm not a kid. I'm like, you're not a kid, but what you are is a highly motivated, highly skilled corporate person who's ignoring their needs. So yeah, I'm gonna step in and go go get a glass of water, go get a meal. Go you can have, be you proud know, of me then. I have I have I my proud of you. Yeah. water bottle always. <laughs> yeah. see, I, see, I'm the guy who likes I'll make I'll make my wife breakfast and I walk in and I actually like accidentally get on camera to be like, oh look who's look who's serving me right now, kind of thing. <laughs> Mark, like, I want to know where this is happening. Yeah, like, yeah. These two guys I, are I, in I the was, same community. Oh shoot, issue. Mark, I'm Why sorry, is this man. Not <laughs> no, I, I was I was about to like text you, text you both. Like you guys are making me look like shut shit. Up. <laughs> shut I thought up. I saw I thought I saw steam coming out of his ears while we were no 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 no. There. All of my kids are in school. All my kids are in school, so that's yeah. the only reason. My, mine too. So that so is there. The that's all like, it is. Older it's... kids in school. <laughs> That's swear got the, got the pass thank god <laughs> yeah that's that'll get, that, that gets you out of that little bit of it so well hey mark thanks for coming uh in and, and talking with us and giving us insight into what's going on with the family man it's it's great to finally get to actually meet you too you know i know we we've seen you talk over some things on the in the group so it's nice to put a face with the name and hopefully uh if everything okay so it is it, for, i was like is that me <laughs> nah. nope and, and if it's everything, rock. if everything, oh, am I going out again? You froze, yeah. You're good now. This is why I edit the podcast. Wah, wah. So, but it's, it's glad, I'm glad to finally get to meet you. I, I honestly, I hope if it would work out for you, uh, for you to be able to get to come to Home Dad Con out in uh, Phoenix uh, at the end of September. Um, it's a, a weekend mm -hmm. of uh, stay at home dads getting together and it's a professional building for four dads. So we'll have lots of speakers and just time to get together with a lot of the guys that are online and just have camaraderie. And um, it's just, it's a good time. Uh, we've been doing it for a while. We actually had it here in Cincinnati uh, this past year. I, I was hosting it. That's where I'm from. Um, and we had about a hundred dads from all over the country that came in. So it was a, it was a great time, but yeah, that's cool. I would love to check that out. Awesome. Uh, am I allowed to plug my blog? Yeah, man, definitely. Before you go, sure. Okay. Check it out. Uh, we Heart Dad. That's W E H E A R T dad.com. It's uh, my chronicle of uh, my sort of crazy adventures with our screwed up kids and their screwed up parents. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah, Imperfect. definitely. Imperfect uh, kids. Right. I, Thanks, I'll, guys. It was great to meet both yeah. of you, and I'll, I'll see you around in the group. Sounds I hope good. so, Mark. Definitely. We'll talk, so, we'll right, talk soon. Care. I got some, I got some resources for you with your blog later. We'll talk. <laughs> awesome. I, I'll get you hooked. I'll get you hooked up with some stuff, man. But yeah, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. All right. So now we're going to switch gears and uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Becca Block and Grace Edwards, and they are co-writing uh, 
the book that uh, is not out on shelves just yet. It's still in the works on some different areas, but it's Can You Help Me Give a Shit? Uh, with an apostrophe. There's like a little mark in there. So, but we'll say it because it's a podcast and that's how we, we do things here. Um, and I, I love it. It's a great title, honestly, very catchy. I, I feel like if it was on the bookshelf and I walked in, it would stop me in my tracks and I would have to figure out what, go see what it was. So uh, kudos on, on the title, but welcome to the show. Um, Grace, you've gotten to kind of be a fly on the wall during uh, all of that there in the back, probably wondering whether or not you want to eject right now from talking to us, but I'm glad that uh, you bring our age demographic way down coming on and uh, it's good to have you. Yay, yay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Definitely. Um, so we were talking a little bit about you um, when you were standing there. So you go to an Ivy League, Ivy League school. Tell us a little bit about who you are, like where you're going to school at and, and what you're going to school for. Yeah, um, I am a first year at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, My major is health and societies, which is kind of like public health for other universities, Um, but I'm a pre-med student and I am hoping to do a minor in journalistic writing. Uh, So yeah, I'm originally from Maryland, but my dad and I moved out to Philly suburbs this past summer. Okay, awesome. And and Becca, uh, what is your title and and what do you do uh, outside of uh, writing? Yeah, so... um... My full-time employment, I'm the Assistant Vice President of Innovation and Improvement at Springboard Collaborative, which is a literacy-oriented nonprofit um, that's headquartered in Philly, and but nationally based. So we work with schools all around the district, really, all around the country. Awesome. Nice. Very cool. So, you know, like I said, you guys, uh, Mark had reached out, said that you guys had a book, and, uh, you know, we started talking about different things. I, I'm curious, where did the connection take place between a, a student and someone working in the nonprofit industry? Like, how did that all come about? Cause that's, a, seems like there's some puzzle pieces that need to be put into place for this to all kind of connect and make sense. Yeah. So I, I used to be a professor. Um, that's part of where I first got my um, real love and passion for working with, with basically anybody age, you know, 14 to about 22. Um, because I had a lot of dual enrolled students in the the schools where I taught. Um, And uh, Grace's dad, who is also a former professor, um, and I happened to live on the same block. And we met and we're talking about, you know, being being recovering academics um, and, Uh uh, you know, what we missed and didn't miss about the classroom. And I mentioned that I had been a writing professor and, and he said, oh, my daughter is interested in she's she's minoring in journalism I bet she would want to talk to you um, and so we ended up having a conversation this is you know quite a uh, sometime last year um, having a conversation uh, at at a block party actually <laughs> uh, and and in the midst of that conversation Grace was talking about um, some of the things that she had found moments that she'd found most inspiring and most um, frustrating in high school and in college um, and the themes that she was talking about without me having told her any of the research that I'm familiar with on adolescent motivation and positive youth development and any of those kinds of things were just lining up perfectly with the exact same things that I've heard coming from the young people that I've worked with or had the privilege of, of working with other colleagues who are working with young people. Uh, the same themes come up over and over again. Um, and I had already uh, put together the idea for this book and, and knew that I wanted to start interviewing people. And- I ask her like, hey, can you be the first person that I interview? What you're talking about aligns perfectly with um, exactly this, this content that I think would really be helpful for any adults who care about people in this age range and are just baffled about like, what is going on? How do I help them? They simultaneously feel really motivated by some things and totally demotivated at other moments and really deeply apathetic at some times. And then, but then I see this spark that I want to nurture and like, what do I do? How do I do that? And I think that, um, this framework is really helpful and Grace was wonderful and gracious, delightful person and said, sure. And what followed was like a very long conversation. We talked for like two and a half hours, didn't we, Grace? It was something ridiculous. I'm surprised that my phone kept recording the whole time. Um, and then talked further as I you know, shared the notes and shared, and I was like, do you wanna do this with me? You wanna be a journalist. And you were talking about the reason you wanna be a journalist is because you wanna help the communities that you care about. And that's the same purpose of this book. Like, do you, do you want to do this project together? Because I think it would benefit from having 
a young, not, not just young people's voices being interviewed, but a young person helping to shape the way that we frame yeah. it, talk about it up yeah. front. Um, and fortunately she said, yes. So, <laughs> so that's, that's how, I don't know, Grace, what, anything you want to add to that um, origin story there, but that's my take on it. Our origin story. I love it. Um, I don't have anything else to add. I think you pretty, um, like you hit it on the spot. I had really struggled a lot um, during my first year at Penn, um, not first year, my first semester at Penn. Um, part of it was like finding the motivation to, to want to learn again, especially like after this pandemic. Um, and then like also trying to figure out different strategies of learning again and like figuring out how to learn um, and, di di and just kind of navigating and adjusting to the pace and environment of Penn is a, it's a topic on its own, but um, so that was part of the reason why I was so interested in, in doing this book because I know that there are, my peers were also struggling with this at under, other universities and um, it wasn't just a me thing, it was definitely my generation after this pandemic, so. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. I have to say, I really, I really love it. And in reading like the synopsis that you gave us too, um, it seems like there's a lot more, because when I look at it right now, like my oldest is 15 and he's, he's doing okay. He's not exactly the most motivated person, but we're working with him, but it's still those kind of things where he does just get inexplicably unmotivated, just won't do an assignment and just leaves it and just does not come back to it. Um, and just being kind of overwhelmed sometimes, uh, he's in some, you know, AP courses and what have you, and he wants this for himself. And he wants this college career that he has in mind. He wants to be a veterinarian and he knows what he needs to do, but then some days he just stops. You know, it just loses whatever he had going forward. So, you know, for me, I'm looking at it and I talk with a couple other parents I know that have teenagers and they talk about, um, you know, my generation and probably the generation before me, which was the baby boomers, was a lot of, well, you're just a lazy teenager. You know, you're just lazy. And it's really not that at all. And I've learned that so well with, but talking with other ones and talking about how COVID has one exhausted a lot of children. And I, and I apologize, say children, I'm an old man. So, you know, people in their 20s and younger to me, um, but also has kind of traumatized them and has just pushed them into a place. But from reading the synopsis, it's a lot more than just like right now in COVID that this is kind of an ongoing thing. Yeah. And I'd like to learn a little bit more about that because of, you know, what your view is on, say, education and our educational system and how that's causing yeah. issues. Yeah, so I, the nonprofit before the one that I work at currently um, was focused on high school students primarily and on uh, the mindsets and skill sets that especially high school students who are in chronically under-resourced, systematically deprived school systems, neighborhoods, communities, right? Um, the young people who had experienced the most amount of trauma from, from being in across intergenerational poverty and all those kinds of things. And, and the effects that that has on just shutting out, oh no, do we lose Grace? Or, oh, just the video shut down. Okay. Um, the, the effects that has on just diminishing your sense of what's possible, right? And this well preceded COVID, it has massive effects. Um, and what that nonprofit did that really inspired me was why I gave up tenure. I've been a tenured professor. I worked for them as a consultant and I was so inspired by what they were doing and, and what I saw the, the impact being with young people that I was like, that's it, I'm out. This is what I wanna go um, support. Um, is that they would put folks that uh, they called dream directors into schools. And the job of those folks was just, just to be there to hold the space for a greater level of possibility. They would, they would expose students to, to opportunities they'd never seen before. They would bring in speakers and they would bring in political or acti um, activist opportunities, or they would bring them out to you know, arts um, encounters or other cultural encounters. And suddenly you would start seeing these young people who had no engagement, who thought school was useless, who thought their future had no shot at anything um, useful or interesting, and that they were just gonna replicate exactly what they'd seen in the communities around them and, and, and didn't have any sense of hope, suddenly start to have dreams. That's why we called them dream directors. And the whole idea yeah. was to provide people who could actually then support you. Like, okay, if you have this dream, if you want to become a veterinarian now that you're seeing that that's a possibility, or if you want to even just make this change in your school, then, you've, then now you got to build the skills and the mindsets that it takes to persist over obstacles, to be able to figure out budgets, to be able to make project plans, all those types of both tactical and kind of more intangible things. But in order for any of that to happen at a foundational level, first, you have to have a relationship. You have to have authentic relationships within that context, or you're never going to feel enough safety 
to open up and even consider that there's some kind of potential or possibility or anything like that. Yeah. It has to have that safe space for that like baseline foundational need. Um, and then you have to feel like that you can make choices that matter to you. You have to, yeah. you have to be able to feel like, well, if I make a choice, if I want to lean into doing something to help change my school environment or to become a veterinarian or to become a medical journalist, Grace, I'm stealing from you now, you have to believe that that's, that you actually, your choices will allow you to go in that direction. And then you have to believe that you either have the skills you need to do that or that you're capable of building them. And if you don't have those three things happening in any context that you're in, inside school or outside of school, you're not gonna be able to sustain motivation. The kind of extrinsic motivation that is like, ah, I'm trying to avoid this punishment or, oh, I wanna get this reward will only last for really short periods of time. And it's really exhausting and taxing to our bodies and our minds. And so to me, the effect of COVID, I look at all of this positive use development stuff that I was involved in well before COVID and, and learning about through both direct research and reading all kinds of secondary research. And then you look at the impact of COVID and you go, of course, it's way worse now. Of course it is, because what you just did was systematically deprive people from access to their authentic relationships, because now the way that everybody could engage was over screens. Yeah. Then you decrease their sense that they could have skills, because suddenly we all needed to learn a whole new set of skills about how to do all this stuff through screens. And you decreased any sense that you were able to make meaningful choices, because suddenly everything was just this reactionary place. And you massively increased the amount of stress, which means that any of that ability of extrinsic motivators, either fear-based or reward-based to motivate you, just doesn't, it's, it's like, it would be like if somebody goes, you know, oh, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you come, and I'm, I'm dead ass tired because my four-year-old has had me up for all night for three nights in a row. I don't care how much I would love that a hundred bucks. You're not going to get me off the couch. I'm exhausted. I'm depleted. There's nothing left for me to go after that yeah. kind of motivation for. It has to be things that fill the bucket. Um, well, I just that, went on a little bit of a rant. So no, you're fine. <laughs> no, it was <laughs> great. That was fantastic. Well, I got, and you, that, you can feel the passion, which yeah. is what I really, I mean, it's obviously you, you changed careers because of this passion you have for it. So uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Brock. I'm sorry, but I, no, I love it, fine. Becca. It was yeah. awesome. Well, I was just going to say like, I, I, it's great. Everything that you're saying, because it's bringing a lot of just like insight into the way that you're going about just researching these things. Like, you know, you're, you're putting all the pieces together. But it brings out a question for me is like, so to this is more of a question towards Grace, really, because I'm kind of curious, like out of what Becca is talking about and also about just the research that you guys have been doing together, like one, what would be like your top takeaways from what you're seeing out of that? And then how is those things that you're getting, like, how's that like influence the way that you think about education, whether it be like your past education or your present education? And then I'll just throw in a third little one here for you. But with that all connected, how do you see those things coming together to be able to um, touch and talk to parents who are trying to figure out how to get their kids to be motivated or even how to like just meet them in their motivation? I know that's a lot. If you have to ask me as we're going along, be like, I didn't remember any of those things. Like, just stop <laughs> me. Like, Brock, like, can you tell me what that was? I'm, I'm one totally at a time. <laughs> I'm, no, a horrible, um, I'm a horrible uh, interviewer when it comes to just throwing questions out like that. <laughs> no, no, no. I think this is great. I have to say, though, I'm so used to being on the other side asking questions. So it's a little weird responding to the questions and, and, ha and having to come up with answers on the fly. But um, I think some of my major takeaways from, from the interviews that we've done and from just like working on the book it's really just confirmed everything that I have understood about my education, the education system um, and the flaws of the education system. There's so many. Um, and while I'm super grateful for, for, my, for my education um, from Maryland and also the school that I'm at right now, I'm so grateful. Um, there are a lot of flaws and a lot of those flaws are not only systemic, but also um, personal and how we treat young people and how we treat like our generation. Um, similarly to what Becca had said earlier, I just always feel inspired um, by my peers who are doing similar things or have done similar things that I have done um, in previous years. Um, wow, major takeaways. 
I think the biggest takeaway is something that I have always known and it's that we we need to have this this intergenerational connection. Um, I feel like in recent years, my generation has um, <laughs> maybe not been the kindest to baby boomers and those who are <laughs> older than <Nope>. us. <laughs> but um, at the same time, um, it's it's also on it's also um, the same reaction that baby boomers have for us, right? Um, and I just think that there's just so much wisdom um, from previous generations. Um, and also wisdom from my generation. You know, our generations are just so vastly different in how we communicate, but also how we view the world, um, how we view politics, how we view like social issues. It's, it's just such an interesting progression. And I just think that it's super important to be able to share that information. Um, that legacy knowledge is what my dad would call it um, between yes. our generations and be able to kind of build upon um, build upon that wisdom. It only it can only get better, hopefully. Right. So those are kind of the major takeaways. There are a couple other questions. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat them? <laughs> no, yeah, totally, totally. So based on that, how ha how is that like influence? You're talking about a little bit of actually like how it influences like the education side of things for you. But like, what do you want? from the, the writings that you and Vec are putting together for uh, parents to be able to take that, like what's kind of like the goal or the target with, with talking to parents about this subject? Yeah, I think, not I think, I, I would hope that parents and adults would just be more empathetic to our generation. Um, I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again, that there are just so many distractions um, and just so many different um, factors uh, that impact my generation, not only technology, technology is a huge thing, but also, um, like I said, how we communicate uh, and how we see ourselves, how we see others. Um, so I just hope that it's such a, just such a big um, phrasing of words, but I, I just hope that parents and teachers would be able to empathize with the things that we're going through. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to engage with us um, in, in, in helping us develop like our way of thinking about the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's well, fantastic. I, I think too, like you're talking about like technology and communication and stuff, and it is so vastly different. I mean, I know like when I was coming in, to college, um, the internet kind of had just sort of like kicked into gear. Like I had just gotten like my first email address and stuff like that. And it's well. like, you know, and it's like now, like, I mean, yeah, this, I mean, I'm 42. <laughs> and I like that's, I got my first email address when I was like 16. So like 1996. Um, so it's kind of weird how like that's all sort of played out, but I, I say all that just from the standpoint of, you know, when you talk to younger people, sometimes a lot of older people like joking and they're like you have no idea what it was like to not be able to like know you know like what the weather was like without you know checking a newspaper or something or you know you if you wanted to find out if somebody was home or whatever like you couldn't just text them like you had to call and sometimes you got a busy tone or whatever and you have like the jokes of all the different like this is what the internet sounded like when you like signed on that kind of idea and it's like you don't have any of that anymore it's like you're immediately connected and stuff and so there are these like vast disconnects with how that sort of is and and things but I, I think on the whole I, there are times where I look at the younger generation and the things that they are juggling with technology and I'm I'm a part of that mindset it's so funny because like I'm serious like for 42 like I am very much involved in a lot of social media doing all this different stuff and when I run up beside someone yeah, who's TikTok younger than, dances shut up <laughs> do TikTok dances. <laughs> there's more going on on TikTok than dances I tell you I uh, agree oh my goodness uh, there so, is, there is. He anyway, gives me sorry. so much crap about it no it's okay <laughs> but uh, seriously though, like the thing with it is like you guys are jug you're multitasking all these different like other things coming at you and it just seems like this floodgate and so as far as where we're like oh like they're so crazy like all these different things like at the same time it's like i i, I envy you for the fact that it seems like 
the younger generation has just grabbed onto this idea of like, I can do multiple things at once. Like you see some people who are younger, like they're watching TV, listening to music and like on their phone all at the same time. And you get somebody who's like, are, are you watching that? And like, yeah, I'm watching it. And I'm also saying like, my wife and I are really bad at that actually. Even, and even though we're <laughs> older, yeah. but still, um, yeah, I mean that to me, it's just all wrapped up into kind of the stuff you're talking about is just this idea of having to sort of switch the mind as to what's going on. Um, I, and, and with that though, like motivation is definitely something that can not only get after the younger generation, I, as I was like reading through like just the different excerpts and things that you had sent over to us. Um, I, I, I battle with, motivation. I mean, there are lots of things that I want to do. There are things that are, I am passionate about and there are times I'll get going with it and it just, the well dries up real quick. Yeah. And, um, so that's, that's something that happens even, even later on in life with, with stuff, but with the fact that you are pre-med <laughs> and just getting started with your college life and very much young adult life, um, how, how do you, um, come out of that, that dry. Well, what are you, what are you doing when you feel like you, uh, do, you're not motivated with the things that you know, you you'd like to be doing? Yeah. Oh my, what a, that's what a heavy topic. Um, <laughs> I always get actually, one before, good one in. <laughs> I actually want to, um, kind of address some of the things that you had said earlier. Um, first, I think you are, more active on social media than I am. I currently <laughs> actually have no social media. So um, I think you're winning in that area. Um, but, you know, I you touched on something that made me think about a lot of the things that my generation is juggling with, right? Um, and, I, and I would argue that if you see me looking down, I'm like writing notes so I don't forget. Um, you're a journalist. <laughs> yeah, you're a journalist. You're doing exactly Do what you're supposed yeah. to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as as a writer, or a wannabe writer at least, I'm, I applaud you. I'm like, oh, look, a pen and paper, that's all. Awesome. So yeah, go for it. Um, you know, I would argue that we are we have always had to deal with a lot of these issues, issues of racism, misogyny, body issues. It's just a lot more heightened now with technology. Um, there's, and there's, you know, TikTok, you talk about TikTok, there's always so much information and just like um, decomposition, um, decomposing like these dense ideas of, of like, um, <laughs> like the female gaze or like male gaze, like different social issues that you normally wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't hear about those things on the news or any, or any of this um, outlet. So, um, I just kind of wanted, those were kind of the thoughts that were coming in my, in my head when you were speaking. Wow, in terms of bouncing back, um, yeah, that's a, that is something that I think about often, um, especially now. It's, it's really hard. It's really difficult. Uh, and I say this with a smile on my face because I know that um, it's worth it. Um, I think in high school, it was much easier because you knew what the end goal was. Um, now for me, sometimes it can be really difficult to keep that um, in mind, especially with, you know, like you said, there's just so many, we're just bombarded with so many things, especially at Penn, so there's just so many pressures um, that are just building upon you, um, either external or internal. So. Um, like I'll, I'll say this, like I, I just um, got a, my grade back from my chem midterm um, that I had like last, last Monday. And I did really well on it um, based on my previous grades from last semester. And I was really proud of it this morning. And then I came to class and I started hearing other people talk about their grades and their grades were so much better than mine. And then after class, I just felt so discouraged. Um, and I just had to remember that um, it, it can be really hard to, to bounce back. It can be really hard to, to not get discouraged and feel like you are incapable of, of succeeding or whatever your definition of success may be. Um, but I think a lot of the times that what helps me um, 
it's just finding progress in another area and building that confidence. Um, sometimes I, I may need to take a break from chem or whatever subject that might be and work on something that that motivates me or 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 encourages me a bit more. So like sometimes, not sometimes, I, I'll, I will switch to working on the book or I'll switch to working on something for my health and societies class, something that um, I was a little bit more enjoyable and not as dense as chemistry, but that's just an example for myself. But I think those are the kind of things that um, that help me when it's when I it's hard to bounce back. Um, I think also just talking to my dad, <laughs> and that's just the thing like that intergenerational um, wisdom. You know, talking to my dad really helps, uh, and he's like really close by, and he he really is just like a phone call away. Uh, so he's a lot of the times he's able to give me that encouragement to, to keep going. <laughs> That's awesome. So real quick, and I'm going to throw it to Danny and let him ask some questions too. But I, I have to say like, just the, 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 the way you talk about your dad and reaction, like no joke, just to kind of give you a little flash forward to the future for things. But honestly, like as parents, like that's the one thing that all of us sort of like hold really hard, like really tight in our heart is that we will have that kind of close knit relationship with our kids as they move on through life. And it changes, you know, I mean, like when, when you're in the house, like we're watching over and you're protecting you. when you leave the house, it's more of a, like, okay, we're in an advisory type role type thing. And it's like, for us, it's like our heart just like, wells and bursts every time you call up and they're like hey like i just need to ask you this or i just want to tell you this and you're like oh my gosh so um although your dad might not tell you that honestly that's what's going on with him and i see becca's sure. face lighting up too and so she i can tell she's in agreement as well but um I, yeah i just wanted you to know that like it it's uh it's great to hear you uh to, to talk about your dad like that that's mm -hmm. awesome yeah, I yeah. talk to my dad every day, <laughs> nice, every nice. morning, every evening. <laughs> hey, I'm 42 and I still talk to my parents almost on a regular basis as well. So I, yeah. yeah, I understand that connection. Yeah, it is fantastic. And you can tell too, with who you are now in, in college and being an adult and out, out on your own. And we don't, I mean, we don't look at you and go, well, this is somebody's child. You know, this is just another adult out there making their way through the world, but you can absolutely tell when you talk about not only hit your relationship, but also just the way you look at life, that there's somebody there that's been giving you um, this, this guidance, you know, and this reliance that you can, you know, kind of lean on them and like, okay, this is getting a little bit of a struggle. And this is that person. And it's wonderful that it's your parent and that it's your dad. Um, and I want to make note of uh, the a wonderful thing that you said and being that you're looking to be a medical journalist and journalist in general, um, you did very well, I think, for all of the verbiage that you used and the words that you used, um, even though it was kind of extemporaneous and spur of the moment, I think you did great just for what that's worth. Um, because one of the things you said is, and it's very inspiring to me, is the wisdom of your generation and then the wisdom of older generations, whichever generations that might be. We have the typical, you know, memes mindset of, of, of uh, boomers versus millennials kind of thing. And that's not really what we're looking at necessarily, but the fact that uh, all of them have their own wisdom, all of them have that their own thing that they are better at or more experienced at. And I love that you brought that up too, um, because it's for both sides of that equation is being able to look at the younger generation, because a lot of times we do, we're going, ah, you're just a kid, what do you know? No, that's not at all the reality of it, because you're an adult, you know, you're out on your own. I know you, you know, you call your dad a lot, that's fantastic, but you're doing all of this, you know, you're, you're living your life, and you're the adult in this situation, and you're writing a book, and that's just awesome in itself, but then it's a book that's going to help build empathy towards the stories of other young adults, and children in high school that are going to need that someone to look at them and say, well, why are they doing this? Oh, it's because they're dealing with this, this, and this in our school systems. This is going on. Um, and I applaud you really for, for everything that you've said, but that's definitely the wisdom of the generations has really touched me personally. So I just want to share in relation to this. So Grace, um, asked one of the, this is a standard interview question, but it was Grace who came up with it. So I want to give Grace the extra credit there um, of asking the question of what is something you wish, of, you know, the young folks that we interview, what is something you wish your teachers or parents knew about you or your peers? And one of the answers from one of the students 
um, who really inspired me. So first he, you know, kind of comically said, uh, shit's hard right now, y'all. Okay. <laughs> but then he said, <laughs> here's, here's, here's the thing. Student problems are just adult problems for younger people. The issues and problems adults face and that students face are the same. It gives the same anxiety and stress to students as it does adults. Just because they're young doesn't mean they aren't aware and they aren't engaged and that they aren't facing really serious issues in their day-to-day -day lives. So acknowledging that and understanding that students have their own lives, thoughts, and opinions and are their own people and deserve to be treated with respect and empathy. And it doesn't go away just because they're young. A lot of them do bring a lot of intelligence and wisdom and do care a lot about their education, whether they show it or not. At the end of the day, it's hard not to care about something you're spending 40 hours a week or more doing. So coming from a place of empathy and wanting to hear students out that you would give the same way you would give to anyone else is really critical. It's your step zero to fixing a lot of the problems you see in education and understanding more about what's happening. Oftentimes parents might feel disconnected from their kids and a lot of teachers feel similarly, but just working with them first and coming from a place of not wanting to lecture or immediately make change and fix it, but a place to really hear them out and understand talk to them, ask what they're thinking about and worried about what they're spending their time doing, why they're spending their time on that, and if they do care. Because oftentimes when students say they don't care, they actually do care a lot. It's just not about the thing they think you're asking about. Wow. And it, it just really struck me. I mean, this is an 18 year old, y'all. He's not even graduated high school yet. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it just really struck me. I bolded it. That's why I could reaccess it so quickly. Yeah. Um, because I think especially that point of like, when someone says, I don't care, apathy is a very natural and actually pretty useful defense mechanism against being disempowered, right? If you are systematically deprived of meaningful choices all the time, one of the students we talked about, we asked her the most engaging moment. And actually the first thing that came to mind was the first time she got in a class and the adult leading that class said, you all don't have to ask me if you need to go to the bathroom, just go to the bathroom. Mm. Think about that wow. for a second, right? Think about the agency over our bodies and how as 40 something year olds, like all of us, except for Grace are, how humiliating and dehumanizing it would be if we had to ask someone every time, mm. if in my work day, I would, I'd be in a problem because uh, having birth to children, I got to run to the bathroom about every hour. That'd be a real problem for me, right? Yeah. If I had to like, if I had to make that visible, if I had to ask permission. And so if we think about the level of autonomy that we take for granted and that students in school are consistently stripped of without even thinking about it, without even thinking about why we're doing it and what the effects are and, and the effect that has of like, I feel like we have this cultural narrative just like, oh, teenagers, you know, they're just whatever about things or they just don't care. Or they're so apathetic. And it's this very judgy kind of narrative rather than stopping to be like, why? Why would a large swath of people for a certain period of time in their lives all consistently become apathetic? Is it possible that there's something going on that's not just, oh, hormones, right? But like- right. Right. that would drive that apathy. And so when you're asking before of like, what do you hope parents get out of this? What I hope I get out of this is a parent who will have a teenager soon. And as an aunt who has had a number of teenage <laughs> nieces and nephews that are now adults, um, is that reminder of how easy it is to only occupy your own position and, and be like, well, I'm clear on what you should be doing. And I'm clear on what would make your life better. And this has been my job as your parent is to make sure that your life was safe and protected and getting better, et cetera, et cetera, when you're younger and to not make that pivot. That's what I'm hoping it will do. Honestly, if I'm like the part of me that's writing it for myself, it's like my own reminder that in a couple of years, when my kid hits high school, I want to make sure that I am engaging with him in a way that is first, let me listen and seek to understand rather than first, let me bring my agenda to this conversation about what you should be doing with your life and how you should be feeling and what you should be doing about it. Um, so anyways. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, awesome. I was like, what you're talking about is something that I was very much like eye open to when um, everything happened with George Floyd and the Black Lives Movement really like bursted onto the scene. Um, here in this little area where I live, um, that, whole movement was actually like 
spurred on by high school kids uh, here in the area. And oh my goodness, I went to a rally. I went just to take photographs. Like I just wanted to see what was going on and just take photographs and just, you know, be there in the moment. But man, these kids got up and just started talking in ways I was like, these aren't kids. Like these are adults, like the way they're talking, the way they're presenting themselves. I was just like, you know, the, you know, you, the title of your book, you know, can you help me give it? <laughs> it's like, they were, they were doing that. Like they, they were giving everybody a reason to, to care about what was going on. And it was amazing to see this rally of, of people that came around and you get certain people are like, Oh, like they're young. What do they know? And other people turn around and be like, are you listening to them? Like, are you actually listening to what they're saying? Because if you're not like, you're completely missing the point. Like these are not just kids that are just trying to, you know, get attention for themselves. Like they are actually sharing what they experience and they're telling, they're telling you what they, ex they're experiencing right here in our town. Like open your eyes type of deal. You know, I was like, so I, I completely uh, agree. Like it's, it's amazing. Like the things that you're, you're talking about there with the stories. I am curious though, like, so I, and you kind of, you, you started to talk about it a little bit, but besides the story of the young man that you, you had talked about, like what other like inspiring uh, stories are you hearing from, from young people while you go through and, uh, and research this, uh, this book? Yeah, there's, there's a lot. And, and I think it's a, I'm glad you're editing because maybe you can edit this in, in retrospect, trying to think it through out loud is tricky for me. There is like a weird paradox, right? So, so referenced in the, in the piece that I sent you and I, um, and it's part of what we're trying to navigate in the book that that um, sort of like high achievement overwhelm and disengagement apathy are from what I'm seeing and Grace, I'm curious if you see the same way, two sides of actually the same coin. It's not like mm. here's the high achieving students over here and here's the disengaged apathetic students over here. It's actually two different reactions to the same set of circumstances, right? Mm. So talking with the, the student who I was quoting a moment ago, Basically, he is in a dual enrolled program where he's simultaneously getting the first two years of his college degree done while finishing up his high school degree. And the reason that he's doing that is because he was so bored in his first year of high school that he just started going, I know I'm not going to be able to deal with this. I know that I can't stay in this environment where I don't have any meaningful choices and I can't do any of the things that I care about. And so sought in that kind of like high achieving sort of way of like, what's another option I can go do in order to get out of this? And then other students that, whose stories I hear and talk with or, or hear my colleagues who are working with them talk um, with and, and share, it's a like, I don't see any other options, so I'm gonna shut down. I'm gonna be apathetic. I'm going to mm. cheat to get the grades that I need to because all of this is meaningless and stupid and why should I waste my time, right? And it's like a whole different perspective to flip from what's wrong with you that you would cheat to why would you cheat? Why is it so valueless, the learning that you might be doing that, that cheating is the more appealing option, right? Like it's, right. it's two different reactions to the same set of circumstances of, I don't see where this is meaningful for me. I don't see where this is relevant. I don't see a reason for me to be here and care because there's not any people here who care about me. And none of this learning applies to anything that I care about for later on in my life. And you're not giving me any meaningful choices. So I'm checking out. Or the high achieving responses, well, all of that, okay, I'm going to find an extra thing I can put on top of this in order to make it meaningful. And so, um, Grace, I would love if you wanted to talk about, I, I don't want to reference people's first names since we haven't checked of who wants to be anonymous versus who not, uh, but the young woman we talked to who talked about the minority scholars program, right? And, and I, I view her as being sort of a like, well, this is not enough in and of its own high school is not enough to be engaging for me so I'm going to add something to it right that then became very engaging and um, lots of what she shared was really inspiring and, and I wondered if we wanted to share some about that yeah um, so yes a lot of what she shared was deeply inspiring she was a part of this program um, for for students of color and um, part of what they did in this program was create development, professional development meetings and trainings for teachers um, so they can equip them and teach them how to talk about race and be comfortable talking about race in the classroom. And so um, it was completely student led. The sponsors of the program allowed them to come up with these different activities and lead different conversations. Um, and she, talked at length about how 
it was empowering to her to be able to shape the minds of the adults that will be teaching her um, or even just adults that will be teaching her generation and um, the ability to to be able to like change someone's mind who may not have been um, empathetic towards students of color previously. So yeah, just, just a little quick synopsis of what her experience was with the program. And how many, uh, how many people have you um, already, uh, how many people have you already interviewed and are there more to be interviewed or kind of what's, what's going on with the process of, of the book? Where's, where's that at? Yeah, there are more, there are more to be interviewed. Um, we uh, have sketched out, so what, what you saw in the book proposal was based on the common narratives that um, had already arisen from experiences that I and some of my colleagues who've been working with young people for a couple decades um, have seen, especially in recent years. Um, and now what we're doing is, is going back and actually engaging in direct, more in-depth conversations with young people who want to engage in those conversations. So. Um, if, yeah, if, if anybody knows a young person in high school or college who's like, I would really love to be interviewed about either the reasons that I find this whole thing freaking miserable or what I've done um, in order to make it not miserable, um, either of those types of stories um, I think are, are really powerful and we are looking to, to add a few more. Um, so thank you for asking that and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to get that. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. Plug yeah. it there in case there's anybody else who wants to be part of it. That's what I was thinking. If yeah, you know, if there's an email address or something that we can post in the show notes to where um, somebody can reach out to you guys and uh, you know make that interview happen, uh, definitely send it to us so that way you know we can help you yeah. along with that because uh, we have plenty of dads that uh, <laughs> have kids who are older but, and and uh, right. you know like Danny was saying his is 15. So I mean, there's there's lots of those. I, I was I was thinking of. Um, Al, Al Watts's son, Miles, who actually presented at uh, Home Dad Con this year. And uh, um, he's getting ready to go off to, to college here pretty soon. So, um, you know, he might be somebody that might be interested in it as well. But um, yeah, no, I, we really appreciate getting to talk to you about this. Uh, I'm, I'm excited yeah. for, for when the book comes out. And honestly, when it does come out, like we'll have to have you back on uh, so that we can talk, uh, talk more about it and, uh, and really get it pushed out there for you. Um, and, you know, we'll stay in contact because I, I definitely want to know when that's going to happen because, uh, yeah, I, like I said, one, I love the title too. The topic is on point um, with everything that's going on here. And um, I, I really wish the best for you all for, you know, the research you're doing and, and hopefully a publisher catches wind of this and, uh, and grabs you guys up because um, it's, uh, I think it's just a topic that uh, up until the point where it came in front of us, I, I never really had even thought about it. So um, mm -hmm. since, since then, I think that it's something where it's like, man, there are other people who are going to feel the same way. Like I never thought about that. And then they're going to hear this and hopefully it's going to, uh, you know, jaw them in a way that's uh, opened their eyes to some other things going on. So yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah. That's that's what we found. So I really appreciate hearing that as well. And and I realized that quickly, just in case you want to weave it back in, you should explain the title where that came from because it's not my words or Grace's words. It comes from a student who was in a, a class um, of one of the colleagues that I was talking about, where she was trying to teach executive functioning skills, and the students just were not. They were students who wanted to get better, right? That whole motivation piece, and she wasn't incorporating motivation into the explicit conversation. And she's like, "You guys say you want to get better at." succeeding in your classes, but you're not practicing any of these skills I'm teaching you. Okay, what's going on? What is it you want? And she asked all of them to write it down anonymously and hand it in. And what was on one of the students' papers, she said, I, actually, a lot of them had different variations of it, but this one put it the most succinctly and clearly, can you help me give a shit? I would mm -hmm. like to give a shit about school, but I just don't, and I don't know how to. Um, and it just really struck me um, when she shared that story with me. I was like, that's the book. So that was the original inspiration for the book. It's like, that's the book that we need to write actually is, is that, um, yeah. is inspired by that exact thing of like, I'd like to, but why don't I, and what can I do about it? And yes. when you realize why you don't, why it's so hard to feel motivated, it actually helps provide a lot of the answers of what to do both systemically for people that want to make systemic change, but also individually for what you can do, you know, within your own just individual life. That's great. Definitely. 
Well, hey, thank you very much for coming on the show mm -hmm. today. And uh, like I said, stay in contact with us because uh, we want to we want to know and see more as it comes along the line. Uh, Grace, uh, good luck to you as uh, you continue on Thanks. with your semester. Hope everything uh, ends well for you uh, as things move along for you uh, with pre med. I know that that can get a uh, can get pretty uh intense i have, I have yeah. friends who are in the medical field so i <laughs> and, and tell your dad we're proud of him yeah for what that's worth <laughs> just, just tell him some two old men on on some podcast he'll never hear he, well we're proud of him she can just send this to him and then he he'll hear this one for sure yeah he should hear this one for sure because then he'll be proud yeah You're like man i gotta, I gotta know those guys uh, <laughs> all right well hey thanks so much and uh, y'all have a great one and uh you know we'll talk to everybody again uh, next week Great. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'm a dad, that's what I do.